hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers, shares, and wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome to ACNS webinars. The speaker for the first session of today is our honorable guest from Australia, Prof. Amal Abu Hamdan. Prof. Amar is a senior consultant neurosurgeon, vascular neurosurgery lead, and director of Neurovascular Surgery Fellowship Program at the Royal Adelaide and Women's and Children's Hospital. She completed her neurosurgery training in Adelaide and Melbourne, and subsequently completed three post FRACS fellowships at the Austin Hospital in Melbourne in epilepsy surgery and the hospital of sick kid children in pediatric neurosurgery and Toronto Western Hospital in vascular neurosurgery. She, she continues to be at the forefront of advancing surgical care working within neuro-oncology and epilepsy surgery multidisciplinary teams chairing the neurovascular MDM, establishing and managing clinical specialty databases and incorporating the latest evidence-based technology and clinical protocols to improve patient recovery and achieve the best possible outcome. She is active in clinical research and postgraduate student supervision and has been the principal and chief investigator for a number of national and international clinical trials including the currently recruiting evacuate RCTs. Dr. Amal is the chair of RACS in South Australia, neurosurgery examiner at the RACS Neurosurgery Court of Examiners and as a representative at Neurosurgical Society of Australasia. We are extremely honored to have her today at our webinars and today she will be talking about multidisciplinary approach to adult and pediatric AVMs. The speaker for the second session of today's webinar is our honorable faculty from China, Prof. Jian Wang. He is a consultant neurosurgeon at the affiliated Changchow No. 2 People's Hospital of Nanjing Medical University. He did his postdoctoral research in neurobiology lab, Nanjing Medical University from 2019 to 2021. His research focuses on the development of new techniques for medical image processing and analysis and applications of neurovascular imaging on hemorrhagic myomyoid disease. He has published more than 10 papers in SCI journals including AJNR. He is the principal investigator of several grants in Changchow and Jiangsu provinces. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinar and today he will be talking about medial cortex leptomeningeal deficiency and recurrent hemorrhages in Moya Moya. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from the Czech Republic, Prof. Vladimir Benes. Prof. Benes has held the position of the head of neurosurgery at the Central Military Hospital Prague and the chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery in the first medical faculty and he was the past vice president of the EANS till 2007 and chairman of the training committee of EANS as well as the president of EANS. Headed the neuroanatomy committee of the WFNS along with Prof. Imad Kanan and he is an invited faculty to various workshops and conferences organized all around the world. He has published a number of articles in various international journals and book chapters. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of today's webinar. The chair for the second session is our honorable faculty from Japan, Prof. Hideto Kimura. Prof. Kimura is a consultant neurosurgeon at the Department of Neurosurgery, Kobe University, Japan. His clinical interests are focused upon the management of complex cerebrovascular diseases and he is one of the most sought after faculty for ACNS workshops for cerebrovascular bypass surgeries. He is also a noted author with several publications in various period journals. And we are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President Prof. Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China and we are extremely grateful to Prof. Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Bun Seng from Malaysia is my co-host for today and with that introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to our Honorable Chair, Prof. Vladimir Benes. Hello everyone. Uh, I must uh, admit that the AVMs are my favorite region. And uh, they represent probably the modal disease in neurosurgery because uh, we now have multimodality treatment, which is uh, endovascular radio surgery, which is surgery, and of course, observation. And as I recall from the past uh, from Australia, there were excellent uh, lectures and articles uh, by Michael Morgan, who was really uh, one of the foremost uh, experts in AVM treatment in, in the world, uh, definitely by all means. He had the upbringing in Mayo Clinic as well as I see that uh, Abu Hamdan, you have uh, training in US as well. So I believe that uh, we shall uh, listen to excellent lecture on pediatric AVMs. And I believe that uh, we shall learn some new facts. And uh, I'm looking forward to that uh, very much. So uh, Amal, please go ahead with your lecture. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, uh, Professor Benes. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kudi, for the uh, introduction. And special thanks, of course, uh, to Professor 
uh, Kato, who's um, been uh, a great role model for us all for um, uh, a very long time. Uh, really look up to her um, surgical expertise and a great educator um, and mentor to many. Um, and it's really a privilege and an honor to also be amongst this esteemed panel here today. Um, uh, presenting on also um, Professor Benner's a, a topic very close to my heart, and uh, which is venous malformation. So I'm both uh, pediatric and adult neurosurgeon. So I'll be talking about uh, multimodality management of um, pediatric and adult AVMs. And whilst we're discussing multimodality treatment, um, I will be focusing on the microsurgical treatment and how we use um, endovascular and and uh, and radiotherapy in uh, or radiosurgery rather uh, in selected uh, cases. So this is um, a photo of um, uh, the Royal Adelaide Hospital, um, which is uh, the adult hospital that I practice at, and separated by the river from. Uh, uh, there is the pediatric hospital. So it's really a very conveniently placed um, sort of uh, biomedical city for uh, an adult a pediatric neurosurgeon uh, with only a couple of kilometers away uh, between the uh, children's and, and the adult hospital. So uh, we're getting uh, we'll get right into it. Um, I have no uh, disclosures relevant to this um uh, to the stalk. So I'm trying to progress my slides. Here we are. We'll start with a case illustration. Um, this is a um, young man, 26 years old, who had sudden collapse at home, uh, early hours of the morning, uh, GCS3. By the time he got to us at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, uh, both his pupils were fixed and dilated. Um, the registrar on call spoke to the consultant on call who said, look, this is probably likely futile, but it hasn't been very long since the pupils have been fixed. So call the vascular consultant and, and see if she can offer anything. So this uh, patient was an extremist. There was no time for a DSA, of course. You can see the tight posterior fossa there. And with the limited CT and geography, you can see that there is um, – uh, evidence of an AVM at the cerebellum medullary angle there, just uh, medial to the entry of the of the vertebral artery that you can see on the screen. So that's pretty much all the information we had uh, going into the surgery. Um, so we did a um, initially the um, uh, craniectomy um, and uh, with some uh, lateral drilling, not the full. Um, far lateral um, or extended retrosigmoid that would be required for an elective operation of an angi of a, a, um, a AVM in this location, uh, just in preparation for if the AVM were to bleed uh, during the surgery, uh, that we would have uh, access to um, the, the vertebral and, and the feeders. Uh, as it turned out, this didn't happen. We were able to evacuate the hematoma he spent uh, um, many months in intensive care after recovering, uh, but eventually recovered well enough uh, that he was able to participate in the consent process that he uh, wanted uh, this AVM definitively treated. Um, and so in the light of day, we were able to get an angiogram, which you see there showing um, Spetzler Martin grade uh, three AVM or Lawton Young grade five um, with uh, with feeders from um, uh, both pica as well as ICA and and both superficial and deep drainage. Uh, so an extended retrosigmoid uh, craniotomy. And uh, uh, this is a, a view at the time of surgery uh, showing the vertebral artery entry in the, in the depth there. Um, and uh, and the AVM nidus uh, just at the at the surface uh, there, um, um, and which you can see a little bit more clearly with the um, with the ICG, um, obviously extended deeper as you can tell from from the uh, angiogram. Um, so we're able to uh, get complete uh, uh, 
resection of the AVM, confirmed uh, as always uh, with a postoperative angiogram. And uh, eventually, uh, again, um, long recovery, uh, but apart from subarabella signs, did make complete recovery. But we're talking about a year's worth. And uh, uh, this is um, uh, someone uh, who uh, really presented an extremist, but we were fortunately able to achieve this sort of outcome for him. Uh, very similar story, but a much smaller and uh, easier AVM to handle here. A 25-year-old man also collapsed while he was running. So this is during the day, but also presented with an extremist. Uh, with pupils fixed. Uh, he also underwent urgent posterior fossa craniectomy, evacuation of the cerebella hematoma. Uh, there was no time for an uh, angiogram, uh, but then when uh, postoperatively, once we stabilized him and were able to get an angiogram, you can see this tiny nidus, superficial drainage, so really a grade one uh, arteriovenous malformation. Uh, so uh, fairly straightforward uh, surgically, um, but similar to the first patient, he was quite uh, quite knocked off from, from the hemorrhage. Um, so this is a view at the time of surgery, uh, utilizing both ICG and we also uh, use the color maps uh, intraoperatively. Um, this is a Charbel flow probe, which we use periodically intraoperatively uh, sequentially as uh, as you disconnect feeders and you can see the um, improvement in the in the flow in the arterialized vein uh, until you achieve the complete uh, resection. So again, this uh, young man made a full recovery, but long time in ICU, long time in rehab before he was able to achieve this outcome. But according to Aruba, which is the main prospective trial on this um, on this topic, um, which looked at adults with uh, unruptured uh, brain AVMs, um, looking at uh, interventional management compared to best medical management, um, the uh, conclusion was that there was uh, a higher risk of intervention compared to medical management. Um, and in fact, uh, they go as far as uh, concluding uh, that a useful management plan um, would be deferral of intervention uh, for uh, a um, incidentally found arteriovenous malformation, wait for a hemorrhage, which may or may never occur and may be mild if it does. Now, you know, this is just two of, you know, hundreds of patients we come across who are really um uh, knocked off and, and disabled by intracerebral hemorrhage from arteriovenous malformation. Um, and, um, you know, but this is the main prospective trial that, that we have on the topic um, and uh, unfortunately still sort of quoted and followed by, by many clinicians. A uh, number of publications uh, followed uh, this Aruba trial uh, with many criticisms, you know, only 13% uh, of the patients that were screened were randomized. Uh, a lot of the patients uh, from the recruiting centers were treated outside the trial. Uh, there was no minimum number of AVM surgery for the participating sites. Um, and the surgery uh, was only really used in 9% of the patients uh, in this and very short follow-up, uh, but the subsequent uh, publication uh, maintained uh, the same conclusion. So um, consequent to that, a number of uh, units around the world um, published their uh, experience uh, with what would have been Aruba-eligible uh, patients showing a very favorable outcome from microsurgical treatment. Um, and showing that surgery is, in fact, a safe and effective uh, treatment, um, particularly in patients with the lower Spetzler-Martin grade. So a number of rebuttals here. I, uh, noted this was in adult patients. Um, uh, pediatric patients were not randomized um, in this trial. Um, so we also looked at our series of Aruba eligible patients um, at the Royal Adelaide. So this is the adult patient around the time of the uh, uh, Aruba recruitment uh, time, uh, looking at uh, patients that were uh, operated electively, but we also compared 
uh, the surgical results um, with or without endovascular treatment preoperatively um, to patients who presented with rupture. Uh, so for the unruptured, all patients um, underwent a discussion in a multidisciplinary team set up um, looking at uh, uh, natural history of the uh, AVM and, and, and balancing that with the treatment mortality, uh, treatment morbidity uh, rather. And, and these were for the incidental asymptomatic uh, patients, but we know that uh, a number of patients did have symptoms and we'll go through what in our series were the main presentations. Um, so all elective patients, the non-time critical uh, ruptured uh, included, so those that didn't have to be rushed to theatre, like the first couple of cases that I showed, were discussed in a multidisciplinary team set up with uh, our endovascular colleagues, uh, radiotherapy colleagues, as well as um, uh, us vascular neurosurgeons. Um, and um, um, if the patient was uh, for intervention, all these modalities were, were considered. Uh, we have uh, published our uh, radio surgery series uh, with the LINAC um, um, uh, modality of, of radiotherapy treatment um, showing um, um, an overall um, obliteration rate of 61%. However, uh, for AVMs less than three centimeters, obliteration rates of seventy um, um, of ninety three percent. But once you get into the second uh, second uh, tier treatment, so second SRS round, uh, that drops down to fifty six percent. So. If we look at uh, adults versus uh, children, obviously children were, as I said, not part of um, the Aruba trial. Um, and, uh, and the reason for that is obviously um, they, they um, with, a, with a long lifespan, uh, the cumulative risk is much higher. And a majority of uh, uh, presentations uh, of AVMs in children is with a hemorrhage. Uh, with a higher bleeding mortality. They do tend to uh, occur in more deep locations and infratentorial um, with a possibly slightly higher rebleed uh, rate, uh, even though they have less chance of uh, having uh, AVM, uh, sorry, aneurysms associated with their AVMs. Um, so really our sort of mantra with, uh, with the pediatric patients um, a pediatric patient that presents, a child that presents with intracerebral hemorrhage, uh, it's an AVM until proven otherwise. Um, it, it, um, um, even though it's overall a very um, low incidence, um, but it does account for a large proportion of, of children that present uh, with a hemorrhage. Uh, and it's the most common mode of, of presentation. Uh, so when we looked at um, our uh, pediatric series around that uh, same time that we looked at the adult series, almost half of our workload in cerebrovascular is, um, is AVM surgery. This is a surgical series. Um, so back to the sort of Aruba eligible patients um, in our adult series. Um, in that time frame, we had a total of 67 patients a uh, slightly uh, higher number of ruptured compared to uh, unruptured, uh, very similar mean age in a ruptured and unruptured group and slight preponderance of ruptured AVMs in males. When we look at um, our pediatric patients, so from the Women's and Children's Hospital here, um, uh, there was uh, twice as many patients that presented with a rupture uh, compared to um, incidental or mildly symptomatic uh, unruptured. Uh, and this includes the arteriovenous, uh, the uh, vein of gallon malformations. Um, so how did they present the unruptured group, adults uh, and kids in our series? Uh, similar to the published series, so um, a high proportion, almost half, did have headaches, and this is even in the absence of um of a rupture, and we'll talk a little bit later in the lecture on on uh, the sort of subset that tend to have a higher rate of headaches um, based on location. Uh, seizures was next, 
uh, completely incidental finding where the MRI scan was done for a different reason. Uh, one patient had trigeminalgia. This is this, the angiogram that you can see there, a uh, pretty elaborate cause of a trigeminal neuralgia. Um, and uh, this was her postoperative uh, angiogram, uh, uh, not only uh, curing her trigeminal neuralgia, but uh, uh, curing her AVM and eliminating her risk of hemorrhage. Um, very small proportion of uh, tinnitus. We had one patient um, who uh, had an AVM uh, resected, having had it discovered on surveillance uh, because they'd had it treated as a child. So resected as a child, we followed them up um, and within a decade or so had a, a recurrence um, which was uh, retreated, re-resected um, uh, before it caused the patient any symptoms. And so uh, in a, in a pediatric group, um, main presentations were headaches, seizures, or incidental finding in the unruptured group. Um, so what about patients who presented uh, with epilepsy? This is um, one of the older patients uh, in my series here. She's 59. She had um, drug-resistant epilepsy. She'd been on three anti-epileptic medications managed by her neurologist. Um, and uh, in a, she'd had a remote history of a hemorrhage, was told uh, that her AVM was inoperable, which is why her neurologist was just managing medically um, and didn't refer because this was sort of in her notes that this is an inoperable AVM. Presumably, um, you know, people looked at those massive varices uh, draining the AVM and included that in the size of the nidus, uh, hence uh, um, the, the conclusion that, uh, that this was too high grade and too high risk. Uh, but when she was referred to me, and you look at these AVM, <clears throat> you look at the CTA and the MRI scan, you can see that a lot of what may have been included in the measurements uh, is those massive varices uh, that you can see here. And you also note that uh, on, on this um, MRI uh, possible area of gliosis um, uh, around the AVM, uh, suggesting that um, uh, remote history of uh, of hemorrhage. Um, this is then her angiogram uh, showing that it was, uh, in fact, a Spetzler-Martin grade uh, three. It was a four centimeter nidus if you exclude uh, the, the varices, the draining varices. Uh, it had MCA and PCA supply. Um, and the drainage was uh, actually mostly superficial. Uh, but it was in an eloquent area. It is um, her dominant temporal lobe. Uh, she's she's right-handed. Um, so after a long discussion and multidisciplinary team meeting, whether we needed any um, um, any uh, adjunct to treatment like preoperative embolization, we thought possibly the PCA supply may benefit uh, from preoperative um, uh, embolization, but the MCA branches, uh, feeders, uh, would be very easily accessible uh, with the through through the craniotomy and very early on in the piece. Uh, so so very little embolization and really just of the PCA feeder uh, and and complete resection was obtained. You can see we probably blew the budget on on uh, on aneurysm and AVM clips there, but. Uh, great outcome, completely seizure-free, um, and uh, the MRS-1 was really just from early headaches uh, at the craniotomy site, which were managed just with some amitriptyline uh, and made an excellent recovery and was able to be independent again. And, you know, she was already a grandma and was able to drive uh, her grandchildren again and look after them uh, and, and return to work, um, so regained her independence. Uh, this is another young man who presented uh, with uh, seizures, and you can see this uh, uh, dominant um, parietal um, uh, AVM in the primary sensory area. Um, so, Spessler Martin grade uh, three, uh, based on uh, size um, just over three centimeters, um, eloquence, of course, but superficial venous drainage. Uh, supply as expected in this area from anterior cerebral and middle cerebral artery branches. So 
so long discussion um, with him and his family uh, and in our MDT meeting about the um, treatment modality for this. And uh, he was offered uh, the surgery. Uh, no preoperative uh, preoperative embolization uh, was thought to help uh, in this case, again, uh, because with the approach, uh, we thought that the feeders um, uh, could be access very early on in the surgery. Uh, these are some um, intraoperative uh, pictures. So here we are defining uh, the feeders, um, uh, the arachnoid uh, dissection, uh, defining uh, the uh, nidus and the feeding uh, vessel. So not rushing into the nidus, just starting with the so-called dissection to identify uh, normal anatomy, the feeders and the draining vein and, and preserving that obviously with your life until until the very end. Um, here we are um, doing the interhemispheric dissection. You can see the falx medially there, and that's to identify the anterior cerebral artery supply here and placing temporary clip uh, as we then continue to uh, work around the nidus. This is a temporary clip on the middle cerebral artery just remote to the um, AVM. And once we've got those on board, then dissecting around uh, the nidus. Um, so you've taken some of the heat off of it um, with that temporary clipping uh, of the main feeders. So uh, then we work in sulci. This is uh, vascular microsurgery. This is not tumor surgery. Um, and so proceeding, uh, as you can see here, with the uh, dissection. And we're putting um, any gentle uh, retraction on the actual AVM uh, rather than on the eloquent brain around um, noting that we've already, like I said, taken some of the pressure off, some of the heat off uh, with the temporary clipping. So systematically working around uh, the nidus um, with more of the dynamic retraction uh, once we've reduced that turga uh, slightly with the temporary clipping. Here we are um, working circumferentially. We're getting a little bit uh, deeper and we're starting to see some of the um, uh, smaller uh, feeders uh, in the depth. Um, this is um, early days when um, I was using the um, icicle bipolars. Um, our main workhorse now is um, the other nonstick great uh, Spetzler Malice bipolars. There's also other brands, the Versa True, but um, really it's very helpful having them. Um, um, a non-stick uh, type of uh, of uh, bipolar um, coagulation, but even even your best quality um, bipolars, uh, you know, may not uh, necessarily be able to control some of those uh, red devils that Lawton refers to at the depth of uh, kind of shape AVMs like this near uh, near the ventricle, and this is where you need um, AVM clips. So. Uh, here we are now at the deep face of the AVM um, and uh, and mainly using um, AVM uh, clips uh, to to control the um, um, uh, more challenging to coagulate uh, deep uh, feeders uh, coming out of the ventricle. Uh, this is his uh, post-operative um, uh, scan as well as uh, angiogram uh, showing the complete resection. He also remained uh, seizure free and apart from a clumsy hand um, made a complete uh, recovery uh, and even the left hand clumsiness uh, by one year had almost completely recovered. He returned to uh, work um, within a couple of months of the surgery um, and did extremely well. And we continue, I continue to see him for um, um, some remote flow related uh, uh, aneurysms, which are slowly, uh, slowly ob obliterating as well. Um, this is a young lady, a teenager who had uh, severe headaches, multiple presentations to emergency with severe headaches necessitating. A CT scan almost every time she presented to emergency. Um, and uh, she had this pretty much lower uh, occipital arteriovenous malformation. 
uh, the migraines were really quite intractable and um, uh, she needed to be on multiple medications to help manage that. She was missing a lot of school because of that. So even though she hadn't ruptured, the headache was not from a rupture, uh, but she had very severe disabling headaches. Um the uh, angiogram that you can see here uh, shows a large um, nidus, so just over six centimeters, um, eloquent area, of course, but superficial venous uh, drainage, so Spetzler Martin grade uh, four, um, and fed by uh, PCA, MCA, and there was also um, an ACA in this case. Uh, there was also transcalvarian uh, calvarial flow from the uh, uh, right occipital artery. Um, and so a uh, young lady, uh, very symptomatic from this, still underwent uh, you know, the same discussions that we have with the radio surgery opinion, and uh, uh, and uh, discussing all her uh, options, um, and both her and her parents were adamant um, that they wanted uh, microsurgery, um, despite uh, the higher risk that they were quoted uh, from uh, the surgery, uh, including the inevitable uh, field cut that she will get from this. So uh, this is the exposure at the time of surgery. Um, you know, there's nothing minimally invasive about AVM openings. You go big or you go home. So really exposing widely so you can define the feeders, uh, the draining vein beyond um, beyond the um, uh, AVM and uh, also opening the dura under the operating microscope. Um, so this is not one where uh, you can just uh, open a dura and then only bring in a microscope once that's done because of the risk of injury. You can see that big draining vein on the surface, which could easily be injured on the way in, uh, contravening the, the guiding principles of, of AVM surgery, therefore. Um, so here we are working uh, around the nidus um, and uh, and uh, we're left with that uh, draining vein. You can see it's uh, um, the turga is reduced significantly um, and uh, and you can see that draining vein uh, there. Uh, check with uh, once you feel that you've done uh, all the dissection. Um, with a temporary clip that it's safe to then remove the vein. Um, even when it looks like you're all around the AVM, um, not uncommonly you see some final feeders just as um, uh, the AVM exits, uh, as the draining vein, sorry, exits the uh, uh, the nidus, um, which keeps the vein arterialized till the very end. Um, so just check with a temporary clip before we um, uh, before completing uh, completing the division of the of the vein and uh, and uh, resection of the nidus. Um, this is her post uh, uh, operative um, angiogram uh, and MRI scan. Her migraines. Um, you know, within a week of the surgery, when it was more about uh, just managing the um, wound pain, the migraines completely resolved. It was really quite a dramatic um, improvement uh, and, and continue to be at bay, at bay. This is a number of years ago now. Um, she was left with a hemianopia as expected. Um, but returned to school within a couple of months. And I see her on my weekly hike um, uh, sometimes, um, uh, which is a, a pretty decent uh, decent hike that requires quite a bit of uh, fitness. So uh, what about migraines with AVMs? It's a well-described uh, uh, entity. Um, this is a publication from um, – uh, the unit you know, where I did my fellowship in Toronto at the Toronto Western, um, demonstrating a um, that non-hemorrhagic headache was the most frequent symptom in um, occipital um, occipital AVMs, um, and with a very high rate of um, resolution of those after treatment of uh, the AVM. Um, granted with with um, any modality. Um, so 
What about the ruptured group? How did they uh, present in our series? Um, so headache, uh, but um, uh, otherwise uh, conscious um, in almost uh, 50% uh, in the adults. Um, a focal neurological deficits in about a third, seizures and uh, a sudden collapse and poor GCS in the surgical series um, was in about 14%. Um, it was much higher in the pediatric population. So uh, over a third had poor GCS after sudden collapse in the pediatric population that presented with a rupture. Uh, the location in our surgical series, um, so in adults, um, uh, mainly frontal um, for uh, the ruptured, um, followed by parietal and occipital, but for the unruptured, um, mainly occipital, then frontal and and, and parietal, uh, but with a scattering there um, in all locations, including brainstem. Um, and uh, it, with the pediatric population, um, again, uh, similarly uh, in a ruptured group, uh, a very high proportion of uh, frontal locations, uh, but similarly with parietal and temporal locations. Um, the uh, uh, intranidal, intranidal aneurysms and proximal aneurysms were uh, present in um, two and four patients, respectively, in the ruptured group um, uh, in the adults. Um, this is much lower rate in the pediatric population. Um, which sort of stands to reason, I suppose, they just haven't had enough uh, uh, time for the shear forces to to for for aneurysms to to occur. Um, preoperative embolization um, was that uh, uh, used? Yes, but very judiciously and carefully. And uh, I've put this picture there to remind me that. Um, we used uh, the onyx very carefully. It's obviously very operator dependent. Uh, it really relies on the uh, experience of the operators, and so we work with a, a great INR team. Um, and we are, as a surgeon, uh, the microsurgeon, you have to be there in the anterior suite to uh, really talk to your team about what is necessary and what's going to be helpful for that particular aneurysm. Uh, uh, to to have preoperative embolization as opposed to just risking um, a complication uh, without really reducing the risk of the surgery or helping with the surgery. Um, so uh, consequently, with the unruptured uh, aneurysm, uh, with the unruptured uh, AVMs, um, you know, with with more careful planning, uh, a higher rate. Um, um, of um, of uh, embolization preoperatively that was thought to be uh, helpful in those that had uh, a rupture but were well enough to then have their AVM resected in a in an elective manner uh, in a month or two after their presentation with the hemorrhage once they've recovered. We had one incident, so despite you know being very careful and. Um, uh, and scrutinizing exactly what is going to be helpful to embolize. We still had one post-onyx preoperative embolization hemorrhage, um, um, and that was in a patient who was planned for surgery the following day um, for elective resection, and so consequently it turned into a, an emergency operation and, and we took her to theater there and then um, when, when the... Um, hemorrhage ruptured um, uh, within 12 hours of the embolization. So um, very important to note that if you're going to use embolization, uh, that it's actually to, to help and reduce the risk of the surgery and not to cause more harm. Um, so this is, uh, there's a number of publications on that with 5 to 12% complication rate quoted uh, from preoperative embolization um, and 1% mortality. So uh, very important to emphasize the importance of experience, judgment, and um, if you're not the hybrid vascular neurosurgeon doing the preoperative embolization, making sure that you have very uh, you communicate very clearly with your and our colleagues what is required. Um, and so in a number of patients, I preferred to use um, uh, coils um, 
rather than onyx, particularly with a very high flow to uh, minimize the risk of the onyx uh, shooting off into a draining vein and um, um, and causing hemorrhage. So, you know, the idea is to tame the beast uh, and minimize the bleeding and complications rather than causing more problems. Uh, this is an example of a patient with a, uh, this uh, deep-seated uh, arteriovenous malformation uh, where I thought the embolization preoperatively was helpful. Um, he was an overseas student uh, studying at university, uh, presented with this intraventricular uh, hemorrhage um, uh, and mainly headache with very little um, uh, otherwise in terms of uh, symptoms or signs. Um, so this was a Spessler Martin grade three AVM, uh, about four centimeters in uh, diameter and uh, but deep drainage. Um, in this uh, case, um, again, given that he was well enough and he could have undergone any modality, he was not happy to wait uh, for uh, the delayed obliteration from radio surgery. Um, and uh, uh, even then, obviously, it wasn't. Um, it was one hundred percent, and so uh, he elected to have um, surgery after we defined uh, the AVM uh, with this angiogram. Um, always do three D spins and color maps with uh, all of them, um, and uh, and the supply, as you can see, there is predominantly from ACA as well as uh, PCA. Um, we thought possibly the uh, uh, PCA supply may be helped with just. Uh, calling though, uh, not uh, not with gluing, um, as uh, this would have been on the deep face of the AVM, and I may not be able to access that until early in the early in the surgery. Um, so with that, um, uh, we then proceeded to surgery with the patient in three quarters prone position. Um, and uh, going through the superior parietal uh, lobule horizontal corticotomy, getting down to the, uh, um, the deep into the uh, atrium and uh, systematically working around uh, the AVM. Um, this is his post-operative um, CT angiography and, um, and angiogram showing complete resection. Um, he made complete recovery, so MRS zero at uh, six months and was back to full-time university studies. He's since gone back to his country, but thanks to LinkedIn, we do continue uh, to be in touch and uh, um, and hearing his uh, great accomplishments, um, uh, being completely cured from this and having, uh, given his young age, follow up with a very small chance of recurrence. Um so in the ruptured uh, groups, um, uh, and about 15 uh, patients had emergency craniectomy, um, about half supratentorial, half uh, posterior fossa. Um, and a number who were not in extremis were able to have a delayed uh, craniotomy, um, usually if they're well enough, wait one or two months before, uh, before the surgery. Uh, in the pediatric uh, group, um, uh, also, a number, you know, required emergency operation because they presented in extremis um, uh, versus uh, ten that had uh, that were well enough to have a delayed uh, craniotomy. Um, so, speak of, speaking of uh, uh, Professor Morgan, um, this is um, one of his uh, innumerable publications on AVMs uh, that forms the basis for our. Uh, perioperative uh, protocol for managing high uh, grade AVMs. Um, so anything uh, more than a grade two, uh, we use what's called uh, the Morgan protocol, which uh, I adapted uh, from um, his um, uh, protocol based on uh, his publication, uh, which showed that um, uh, having uh, this protocol instituted, which uh, very carefully um, uh, monitors and manages uh, blood pressure perioperatively, uh, seizure prevention, 
etc., uh, reduce the risk of normal perfusion pressure uh, breakthrough hemorrhage postoperatively. So you could still have a hemorrhage, of course, despite complete uh, resection of, of the AVM. Um, so particularly while we're waiting for um, the sort of remodeling of those um, massive draining veins. Um, and so with patients that have high-grade AVMs resected, we keep them in ICU for a number of days, sometimes asleep, just for very strict blood pressure control. There's no point doing the most phenomenal uh, surgery on a high-grade AVM and then um, uh, and then not paying attention to detail with the peri postoperative management. Um, postoperative DSA, um, so... Um, we don't have a hybrid suite in the, uh, in the public at the Royal Adelaide or uh, the uh, children's uh, yet. So we've got one in private. We're getting one um, in the public uh, soon. Um, so we've only got it right now in the private. So a couple of patients that um, we did in the, that I did in the private hospital were able to do in the hybrid suite and therefore you can check for any residual uh, there and then. Um, but uh, when you if you don't uh, and when you don't, we just get an immediate post-operative angiogram in the same sitting. Um, so and obviously um, in a very uh, small proportion of cases where you do see an intra uh, any any, any residual, um, you have to go back and we usually do it in the same sitting um, uh, on the same day, of course. Um, so MRS score at first uh, follow up, uh, understandably uh, much worse for the ruptured uh, group, um, and uh, and far better with the elective unruptured. Um, with the MRS less than two considered to be a good outcome. Uh, but at one year follow-up, none of the patients that had uh, uh, unruptured AVMs treated had a uh, uh, poor outcome based on their um, MRS scores, unlike the ruptured group, um, mainly based on, on their initial presentation and um, persistence of any deficits that they had from that. Um, Follow-up of these patients, whether it's uh, adults uh, or patients, we do know that AVMs recur, even though uh, surgery gives you the um, immediacy of uh, cure, of, of resection, but, um, but we are still obliged to follow up patients, uh, particularly the pediatric uh, population. So, um, in this uh, systematic review, recurrence rate um, was 2.7% in, in adults and 9.5% and, uh, and in kids. As I mentioned earlier, we had one recurrence in a pediatric patient 10 years later uh, that we'd been following her up. And then when we saw the recurrence, we operated in an elective menu. Um, but it would still be considered for all treatment modalities, of course. Um, so, I uh, conclude by saying that um, whilst optimal management for AVMs does remain uh, controversial, um, we do have that difference between the pediatric and the adult populations where the lifelong risk in the pediatric population uh, is, uh, is higher. So, obviously, we have to do, uh, we have to beat the natural history uh, when, when we offer the treatment. For the adult population, although the Aruba trial does remain the uh, only level one evidence that is uh, available to us for the unruptured brain AVMs, our results, along with all the series that have been published in the literature, demonstrate the safety and efficacy of microsurgical resection in carefully uh, selected population uh, of brain AVM patients. So. Uh, you have to have multidisciplinary center where all the options are discussed and offered to the patients. You must have impeccable microsurgery by subspecialty surgeons to be able to achieve those results and try and beat the uh, the natural history. Uh, you know, it really is inexcusable to give deficits to somebody who is otherwise asymptomatic if we're going to be offer them, offering them treatment. Um, judicious use of preoperative embolization. We want any adjuvant treatment uh, preoperative embolization to help um, with the risks rather than increase the risks. Uh, and the judicious use of ICU care. 
um, for the uh, greater than grade two AVMs as per the Morgan protocol that I mentioned. Um, so once again, um, the series adds to the um, not only emerging, but now fairly well established evidence from number of theories uh, about the safety and efficacy of microsurgery um, with or without preoperative uh, embolization that's carefully used. Um, and, and therefore, we really challenge the conclusion uh, of Aruba that medical management is superior to all uh, interventions and caution against using uh, those results to guide the uh, management of patients. Um, and uh, that really it's our duty and responsibility um, as vascular neurosurgeons to, um, you know, continue to, to, to perform the highest level microsurgery. Uh, but uh, just as importantly, if not more importantly, uh, maintain registries um, of um, of our treatment uh, of our treatment outcomes and uh, and follow up our patients. Uh, so just a slightly lighthearted uh, uh, slide uh, to say: be careful with the with the evidence uh, and the evidence interpretation. Uh, and it's our responsibility to protect the healthcare provision from influences that originate from misuse. Um, of, uh, of poor evidence. Uh, I'd like to thank and acknowledge our um, uh, whole team at the Royal Adelaide and the Children's, including our our team, uh, ICU, radio surgery, all of our trainees and fellows, um, including ones that uh, helped me put some of the data together for this talk. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh. Thank you very much. That was a very comprehensive lecture and uh, an excellent one for that matter. Uh, I, I I must congratulate you to the cases, all except the number two case, uh, where really difficult, difficult uh, AVMs. So uh, you are a brave neurosurgeon in a way. Some of them I wouldn't uh, recommend surgery. So it, it was really excellent, excellent, very good thinking. You were probably a little too mild to Aruba. The criticism was much, much stronger and uh, actually... In my mind, uh, the only thing Aruba told me is the natural risk, two to four percent risk of rupture per year. You you cannot consider surgical cases when there were five of them altogether. So so th that really is not uh, the the study which uh, I would consider. I participated over the two years. I didn't find a single patient to to randomize. Yeah, right. you probably right. had the right the right. same same. Yeah. And that, therein lies the problem. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. But we have to be mindful that, you know, a number of physicians or neurology colleagues do read those conclusions and uh, they may not refer or advise the patient yeah. against yeah. us. So so it is our duty to to keep sharing our results. Exactly. Um, exactly. That, that, that's the largest uh, fault that uh, the neurologists read. They shouldn't read, you know, they should be banned to reading uh, Aruba and these things. Then, uh, was my feeling well that uh, you prefer monotherapy, that you avoid endovascular uh, treatment as long as possible and only in very, very selected cases? Right. Um, again, it's really, uh, I mean, whatever we do with treatment, we uh, have to use it as an adjunct to minimize the risk of um, uh, of the treatment. And, um, you know, it worries me sometimes when people just, you know, use uh, onyx to preoperatively embolize um, um, AVMs without really thinking about the aim, like what are we trying to achieve from this? Uh, you know, why would I want half or you know most of the avm nidus glued if i'm going to resect it you know what i want to help with is you know some deep feeder um that uh, you know i may not encounter until late in the surgery um and and even when we do um uh, use embolization like i'm there with my uh, endovascular colleagues um, in the angio suite to really uh, just limit what vessel is going to be helpful to embolize. Um, you know, like that case I showed with, the, say, the um, drug-resistant epilepsy, that massive temporal AVM that was labeled as inoperable. I mean, there were many feeders that we could have fed 
uh, we could have uh, obliterated pre-op, but why? I was able to, you know, find them preoperatively, uh, sorry, uh, as soon as I opened and and defined um, the areas and, and put a temporary clip on it um, uh, on the feeder. So it was only the PCA that I thought I'm not going to encounter until late that I thought it would be helpful. And even then, um, I asked my INR colleague uh, that she only blocks it with coils and not glue. Um, just to prevent that, you know, small risk, well, up to 10% risk, uh, if you look at the literature, we only had one in our series, but just because we're just so careful with, um, you know, what we actually embolize and make sure we're doing it for a good reason. Um, do you, uh, what, what do you use, Professor Benes? Do you, do, you, do you actually nearly uh, avoid uh, uh, MDOS over the past five, six years? Right. It doesn't help you surgically. You do not handle the gummy uh, piece, you know, and uh, they usually are able to embolize the feeders which are easily accessible to you. So you do not need it. You and then uh, having an, uh, a risk of 7% uh, per procedure, if you imagine grade 4 AVM coming to you and you expose him to 3 pre-op embolization plus surgery is 4 by 7, 28% risk then I do not feel that uh, I can expose the patient to such a risk. Uh, before I shall hand the, the discussion to, to all the others, I have one more question. Uh, you were like a little hesitant about normal perfusion pressure breakthrough. Do you believe in it or not? I mean, look, I think... Um you sort of stand on the shoulders of giants and we've got uh, great experience and publications by Professor Morgan, you know, showing that this protocol, um, you know, uh, significantly reduces that risk. And, you know, yes, it's uh, the price to pay is a little bit of extra time in ICU. Uh, but if, if you can prevent that, you know, a single hemorrhage, um post-operatively then it's it's worth it um you know we have probably uh made it a little bit milder over time in that you know when i first started like i would have them sedated ventilated in icu for like a good five to seven days and you know with time um i think you learn to that the critical thing is the blood pressure management and if you can achieve that with antihypertensives, not with sedation, with the propofol uh, and everything else, uh, and then because, you know, then it takes even longer to wake them up. But you, they don't just suddenly wake up when you uh, stop everything. Uh, so I have um, somehow, uh, somewhat um, modified that over time, but still very judicious about blood pressure management. So I may not keep them sedated and ventilated for the full week, uh, but the blood pressure scrutiny and control um, yeah. definitely maintain, especially for the for the high grades. Like, yeah. You know, you're going to be using the doing uh, operating on grade threes and 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 grade fours. I think it's um, it's important to follow through, not just with meticulous microsurgery, but but with the postoperative management. So, do you do you are you this aggressive with your postoperative management for for the high grades as well? Yeah, yeah. You know, I spent a year with Spetzler, so I must believe in normal perfusion pressure yes. breakthrough. I did a lot of experiments that never was able to model it. So I don't believe in it, but I have the very similar protocol of, as you have for blood pressure measure management. That's probably the crucial thing in uh, during surgery and after surgery for at least two, three days. So it's, it's, I, I fully agree with you. Let me ask you the last question. Uh, how many patients are there which you only observe? You know, you were talking only about those you, you treated. What is the proportion of uh, observed patients? So the ones that um, that we observe um, are generally older patients, unfit patients, um, or, the, or the ones that just refuse uh, treatment. So... Of all the patients that we see in a neurovascular clinic, it is a small proportion, probably less than 10% of AVMs that we see. 
And even then, like when we observe an AVM, like let's say you see a 60-year-old with, uh, you know, a, a deep uh, high-grade AVM who uh, has refused treatment. Um, the question is observing. I mean, we still do, don't get me wrong, but unlike an aneurysm where you're actually looking for increase in size or change in shape, so where there is some evidence behind observing. Um, the observation for AVMs, um, you know, in someone who's already decided, the reason we're observing them is because they usually have decided they don't want treatment. Um, you know, we've offered uh, surgery if it's appropriate. We've offered uh, either stereotactic radiosurgery or staged um, uh, radiosurgery if it's, um, you know, some uh, deep elaborate um say, salamic AVMs or some such thing. Um, but if they do not want uh, treatment, um, you know, we, it's a small proportion. We still observe them. But I've, I'm yet to see a change that has led me to change the management when they've already decided they don't want anything done. Uh, having said that, we have a couple of patients that did not want any treatment who keep coming back with um, uh, symptoms, uh, either a steel phenomenon, but more likely uh, just from stasis of massive varices, and they get thrombus uh, forming within uh, a massive draining vein. Um, now, they still come through a hospital and emergency, and we manage with uh, the symptoms with steroids, Um not really a sort of high risk um, uh, anticoagulation, although we have considered it, but just on balance of risks versus benefits. Um, so, yeah, that's the question that remains in my mind that, you know, we still do it um, for those that you just observe, but um, but I don't know how that's changing our management, except in, in that, you know, just a handful of patients who might just represent with, symptoms related to uh, either steel phenomenon from, you know, a high-grade AVM or thrombus within draining veins. Yeah, good. Uh, you, you are much more aggressive than we are. Uh, for, for, for me, grade 4 or 5 uh, AVM past uh, age of 50, which is asymptomatic, means uh, observation. Yeah. Oh, observation, yeah. but you still see yeah. them, like you still follow them up with imaging. Of and, course, of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. It's my responsibility to, to follow them. Okay, uh, are there other questions from uh, the audience? Well, we can uh, ask Dr. Liu any further questions from you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Raja. Thanks, Professor, for a very nice uh, lecture. I have two questions, Professor. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, uh, AVM resection is not like glioma surgery because glioma, we can do a partial talent resection uh, for function preservation where we, we, can, we can't do it at all and all of our pre-op imaging just show parenchyma functional preservation and nothing to do nothing show us regarding the vascular supply that can preserve the function so uh, my question to you is how much do uh, adjunct in surgery such as intraoperative monitoring uh, or some people may do a uh, surgery uh, for functional preservation in order to safeguard the function in your AVM resection. My second question, Professor, uh, everybody knows uh, uh, pre-op uh, embolization uh, risk uh, and, and because they are sometimes non-selective and sometimes may have uh, some complication from it. And and But however, in, in uh, some high-grade uh, AVM, some of the grade three and grade four, uh, there are now uh, 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 the upcoming practice to use a uh, temporary intermittent uh, uh, balloon occlusion, which deemed to be safer because they don't produce uh, a, a, a complication from what we have done previously, with either with onyx or coil. Uh, what do you think the future, especially among the hybrid neurosurgeon, uh, to use such a procedure, uh, which was uh, uh, was uh, claimed to be able to soften the AVM intraoperatively? Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much um, for these questions. Um, you know, Intraoperative monitoring, um, I ha I am actually using more and more of, which is interesting. You know, usually as people get more senior, they use less of it. 
Um, I am using more of it just because um, um, I, I suppose it's just more information during the surgery. But unlike, you know, temporary clipping on an AVM where uh, – on an aneurysm, sorry um, – where you know uh, you've got a large or a giant AVM and and neural monitoring can help you if you're if you've got a temporary clip on a parent artery. Um, I'm not sure that it's changed my surgery or my practice. I can't think of a single case um, where yeah. neural monitoring actually changed what I did. So um, I am using it more and more. Um, just really to engage all the uh, sort of adjuncts available to us. Um, um, but apart from possibly one case where I had a temporary clip on an ACA in, um, you know, a large parish or uh, AVM and uh, and the sensory signals uh, reduced, and um, you know the neurophysiologist informed me of that, um, and you know I removed it for all it's worth at the time. But as it turned out, it actually had nothing to do with the temporary clip on the ACA, um, and it was more technical issue with anesthesia. Um, so if you're going to use neuromonitoring, um, you know you, you just have to interpret it with caution. Um, I can't tell you that it's made my surgery safer, um, but I still use it. Um, the second question, uh, I'm not sure if I understood it correctly, but if you're saying um, uh, preoperatively or not even preoperatively, just embolizing a feeder of an AVM to reduce the turga as a standalone, or did you mean before surgery? Uh, uh, mainly intraoperatively, uh, intermittent ba balloon occlusion. Intermittent balloon occlusion. Um, intermittent balloon occlusion, yes. I mean, obviously, that requires you to have a hybrid suite, which, um, like I said, we still don't have at the Royal Adelaide or the women's and children's. We're getting it. I've got it in the private. So the handful of AVMs that I've done in the private hospital where, you know, I've taken the patients to the private hospital, um, I've used it more in the sense of um, just having, um, you know, the the angiogram at the end of the procedure uh, to confirm so that, you know, you, you're not taking the patient back and forth. But, um, you know, a balloon embolization, uh, not embolization, just temporary occlusion, uh, I, I can see the merit. I can see the benefit um, of that potentially when, uh, you've got a hybrid suite that's available uh, to you so that, you know, you're almost completely eliminating the risk of preoperative embolization. Um, you know, you're not going to have any glue escaping into the nidus or the vein. Um, uh, the coiling, I think, is is, is lower risk. Um, so I don't know that it's a big advantage over, say, coiling a feeder uh, other than not ruining your good scissors. Um you know, from from cutting coils uh, on a on a feeder, um, but I think it has potential. It has merit, um, and it's certainly something that once we've got the hybrid suite in the in the in the public system, where you know we can, that'll be more easily sort of available. Um, would be something I would certainly consider. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Tata, can we go on with the discussion or? Yes, we can. Please. If Joe Very has, fine. If there is anyone else, yes, Joe <laughs> has raised his arm. I think Joe. Okay. Hi, thanks, Dr. Raja. Thanks, uh, Prof. Imir and Prof. Amal. Thank you very much for a very comprehensive lecture. Uh, I would like to ask uh, regarding uh, SRS uh, in your cases. So you said that you were using line neck. Okay. So uh, two questions for that. Uh, first, uh, when the you plan for the SRS, do you incorporate uh, 3D DSA into your planning or do you just mainly use CTA and MRA inflammation? Um, that's one. And the second question, uh, let's say the patient has been embolized before. Do you include the areas that have been embolized or uh, do you only uh, target the areas that are left behind? Thank you very much. 
Excellent question. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll get to the second point um, on including the uh, embolized uh, component. But um, your first question, um, definitely DSA. We don't base it on CTA and MRI. You, you, need, to, you need to define it uh, based on a gold standard angiogram. Uh, not CT, not uh, uh, MRI, or, oh, I mean, you confuse them, but ultimately it's based on the DSA, no question. Um, in terms of, um, yeah, whether whether you include the embolized part or not, um, you know, there's a reason, that's, that's probably part of the reason why there is, uh, you know, the literature uh, is uh, divided um, on, um the outcomes from SRS in patients who'd had pre-SRS embolization or not. Um, and that's probably part of the reason why in a couple of studies uh, there was a lower obliteration rate in patients who had pre-SRS embolization. And it's probably because, um, you know, the components that were glued on ex- um, were not included um, or not included completely in the SRS plan. Um, yeah, so we still, um, um, we if it's if it's um, a glue that's um, you know just part of the feeder, it's not in it's not included. But if it is an anitis, it's still included uh, for that reason because I think the higher recurrence rate comes from the fact that, um, you know, you're not targeting the areas that were just glued with your SRS. So in other words, it's we've not done. very useful. Been, sorry yeah. to interrupt. We've then staged it. So, so we've had, um, you know, large, long, deep AVMs whereby, uh, you know, you embolize, you pre-SRS embolize it in such a way that you've almost created two separate night eyes, so to speak. And, and so it changes the SRS plan that way um, to reduce the risk, and then you further reduce the risk by staging it rather than just having it in a one sitting. What's what's your approach to those? Um, my center has really limited <laughs> uh, SRS or ABMs, uh, so uh, of course this is a very conflicting thing, and of mm. what we have read. So sometimes uh, we also have different opinions between neurosurgeons and uh, radiation uh, oncologists who is giving it. And uh, I, I wouldn't say I have enough experience to say that uh, we have any good outcomes from either. Or So I was wondering uh, what would be the best. So it seems like uh, best just to include the areas that are already embolized as well. And in other words, pre-op emboliza- uh, pre-SRS embolization doesn't really help in the sense since you're going to include it anyhow. Just going to maybe make it more difficult for the radiation oncologist and an additional risk uh, to the patient when doing the embolization. Yeah. Well, you may, like I said, we minimize this risk by by staging um, the larger the larger AVMs and um, and you know always working with the with our radiation oncologists, like it's never, it's not like sending, referring a metastasis or a glioma for radiation, you know, you're, as the vascular neurosurgeon, it's your duty to just sit with the radiation oncologist when the planning is being done. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you you very much. We had a wonderful discussion and uh, excellent lecture, one of the most beautiful that we have heard about AVM, so I would like to hand over this to Prof. Benes for the concluding remarks. Yeah, I, I, I just would like to stress one thing which uh, you had there, but uh, which probably was not that pronounced, that uh, the AVMs is a rare disease. And in order to treat them properly, you need to concentrate them. And uh, we need probably more than a simple tertiary care hospitals, a really specialized center of you know, we all know volume dependent outcome. So these uh, patients should be concentrated in a really high volume uh, hospitals where all the modalities are written, where you can have the vascular board and all these things. That's probably the most important conclusion I would like to stress. And I especially thank Professor Abu Hamden 
for the lecture, which was excellent and which I really enjoyed very much. Raja, thank you and back to you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I understand it's pretty late in Australia, past 12 a.m. Thank you very much for uh, contributing to the educational courses of the ACNS Prof. Sam Dan. We look forward to seeing you again in the future educational events. So thank you very much. And also to Prof. Vladimir Benes too. I have an update from Prof. Shubin that this uh, webinar has been broadcast on YouTube, WeChat and Zoom. And as of now, we have around 800 people who have joined us live today. So thank you very much. So we'll move on to the second session and I would like to invite Prof. Hidehito Kimura to say a short introduction and invite Prof. Jian Wang for his lecture. Kimura. Yeah, thank you, Raja. Thank you, Raja. A very, very excellent lecture. Yeah, I'm so excited to hear your lecture. Thank you regarding the cutting edge techniques, ABM. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you, Roger. And uh, hello, everyone. And good afternoon, good evening. I'm Hidehito Kimura from Kobe University, Japan. It's a great honor for me to, as well, to chair this webinar. I, I thank ACN's president, Professor Yoko Kato, Professor Yu, and Professor Razia. And uh, I'm glad to introduce the first uh, second speaker, Professor Jian Wang uh, from China. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. He will talk about the medial cortex left meningeal insufficiency and recurrent stroke in Moya Moya disease. So I as a, I usually treat a patient with a Moya Moya disease and sometimes uh, encounter unexpected ictus for the patient is suffering a recurrent stroke and sometimes a recurrent uh, hemorrhage after the operation. And post-operative may suffer in some uh, ischemic complication. So I'm looking to hear your lecture presentation. So please uh, start your presentation when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor, for the invitation uh, for uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Wang Jue from the Department, Department of Neurosurgery uh, in Changzhou, number two, uh, uh, second hospitals. Uh, I have focused on the ischemic care diseases uh, in uh, cerebral disease, uh, especially for the Moya Moya disease. Uh, I have focused, the, focused on this disease uh, over 15 years. Uh, every, um, every neurosurgeon may I found that the Moya Moya disease uh, maybe has some uh, special characters uh, for the, uh, not like the, uh, any others, uh, intracerebral, uh, intracerebral disease. Uh, several conservative treatments can help to the uh, new surgeries to deal with the problem. Uh, but uh, in Moya Moya disease, uh, I think uh, in the ischemia uh, type, uh, the patient can got the conservative treatment and the help to do uh, preventing the uh, further ischemia. But in the hemorrhage Moya disease, I think maybe the uh, uh, ECIC bypass may be the unique uh, techniques for the patient to prevent uh, the further uh, intracranial hemorrhage. So I think uh, before we got a further uh, surgical uh, treatment. So I think uh, when we got the further uh, surgical inter uh, intervention, maybe the major cause of this disease maybe uh, got more the focus. So uh, maybe from the 1910, uh, 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 I focused on the major cause of myeloma disease, especially for the hemorrhage myeloma disease. Uh, the importance of the hemorrhage myeloma disease nature history is, I think, uh, now uh, the 19, from the 1999, uh, I think the very famous international hemorrhage myeloma, myeloma registering uh, cohort was started at the uh, start in Japan, maybe the uh, Japan adult myeloma, myeloma uh, after about 15 years, uh, the patient uh, got the further uh, ECIC bypass and the, any other uh, surgical uh, strategies for preventing hemorrhage. Uh, fortunately, we can see that after the surgical intervention, uh, many patients can got a, a further improved and the decreased the further bleeding rates. Uh, we can see that 
uh, compared with the non-surgical group, the patient got to the surgical uh, intervention can, uh, can uh, got a uh, um, got a uh, uh, experimentally uh, at least uh, for the for, uh, uh, bleeding rates. We can see that we can see uh, the rebellion rate can, can decrease from the uh, 30, uh, 34.2 uh, to the 14.3. Uh, this is uh, the second table is another large uh, registering uh, cohort in our China uh, from the Beijing Canton Hospital. Uh, this is another uh, long-term follow-up cohort. Uh, we can see that um, after the combined combined restoration and the EDARS treatment, the patient also can got um, uh, got a uh, uh, decreased bleeding rates. But we can see that there's also about uh, nearly thirty uh, nearly thirty percent of the patient will got a rebleeding rates during the next ten years period for a follow up time. So. Uh, what is the problem for uh, this hemorrhage um, MMDs? Still got a high rebleeding rate after the surgical relaxation. So I think this is a very, very good question for every uh, several vascular surgeons to thinking. Also, the patient if uh, got a uh, initial surgical intervention, I think uh, there will there was a very ch a challenge for us to get a further intervention. Uh, for the patient where we are present with lower MRC scores and we can consider the flap design and journal and a strict vessel selection and also protecting the revascularization areas. So I think um, uh, 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 in front of this problem, I think the nature history of the hemorrhagic is very important. So uh, this is the sub, uh, subgroup Group analysis for the, from the uh, Japan uh, trials. Uh, we can see that uh, in these figures, we can see that the research group uh, separates the patient's hem uh, hemorrhage site uh, into anterior type and uh, posterior type, and uh, the main uh, the, the main result of this uh, result reviewed, uh, reviewed is that the patient. Uh, initial uh, hemorrhage uh, site located at the posterior type may have the more prevalence of the uh, recurrent hem uh, hemorrhage. This is another uh, nature uh, history uh, cohort study in our team. We can uh, we got a further. Uh, Research about the hemorrhage site for these patients. Uh, the white, the white circle is the uh, the patient after the five uh, after the patient uh, after five years with conservative treatment. There was no further bleeding. Uh, the black uh, the black point is the patient got a further bleeding events. We can see that uh, the most uh, recurrent hemorrhage sites was located uh, per, at the preventricular hemorrhage. Especially, maybe we can see that at the atrium and the uh, posterior portion of the later ventricle, the patient were presented more prevalence of a recurrent hemorrhage. Consider uh, these characters, we think that uh, maybe the preventricular uh, collateral pathways may be uh, maybe have the very uh, important uh, considered in this problem. So uh, we first uh, uh, we'll focus the uh, further to the collateral pathways. Uh, we know that uh, the preventricular hemorrhage uh, was mostly uh, derived from the uh, lentical straight arteries and the thermic arteries and the crowd arteries. Also, we can see that uh, compared to uh, other uh, 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 collateral vessels, uh, we can see that 
the clatters uh, located at uh, uh, the clatters derived from the cryo arteries maybe have the more prevalence of the recurrent hemorrhage rate. So uh, consider the patient the recurrence rate was most located at the uh, atrium and the uh, prosperous portion of the lateral ventricle. We can uh, we have a uh, uh, we think that maybe uh, the later uh, posterior cloud arteries maybe have the more prevalent uh, recurrent rate than those other uh, cloud arteries and atmosphere. So we got a further sub subgroup, na uh, subgroup analysis. We found that yes, uh, the the patient uh, prevalent with the uh, Later, posterior cord arteries and anastomosis may have the more prevalent, uh, more prevalent, uh, prevalence uh, recurrence rate than any other uh, cryo artery anastomosis. So, uh, this is a uh, this is imaging for the for our thinking. We can see that uh, the most uh, Prevention clad clad this was derived from the uh, ventricular straight, thalamic, and cryo, and the, maybe the site located at the uh, preventure or subdimer, uh, I mean that was a weakness for for the uh, for the collateral vessels. Uh, but I think the most key point is that uh, this pathway is uh, is uh, is to are flowing to the cerebral, uh, cerebral, cerebral, yes, yes, ischemia, yes, cerebral. I think that maybe the uh, cortex, the cerebral uh, ischemia, maybe is more important than that. So, uh, we now, uh, two years ago, we got uh, in a preliminary uh, research about this collateral flowing. We, uh, separated this clatter into the uh, lent straight, the lamark and the cradle. Also, uh, about we uh, really uh, uh, spread, uh, separated them to the medial medial artery and osmosis to the cortex and the later medial artery and osmosis to the cortex. We can see uh, this is uh, another uh, paper uh, demonstrated by the Miyakoshi. In the AJMR, we can see that uh, the lateral straight uh, arteries uh, mostly outflowing superior or inferior from the uh, cellular and uh, interhemispheric fissure, and the thermic uh, arteries and osmosis may be uh, outflowing to the insular cortex and the cortex around the central uh, cellular, and the cryo arteries and osmosis may be outflowing to the cortex posterior to the Central cellulose and the insular cortex. So, uh, according to this uh, evidence, we our team got a further analysis that we uh, we uh, we recruited about uh, uh, thirty patients who got a uh, conservative treatment uh, in the hemorrhage patient uh, after about uh, after the over five years follow up. We found that there was about. Uh, 16 patients got a recurrent hemorrhage, and the most patient uh, during this cohort got a recurrent epsilateral hemorrhage. We can see that uh, the most uh, hemorrhage type was about the intraventral hemorrhage, and the target uh, clad anesthetic characters was focused on the uh, middle cortex portion. We can see that more. Most of the patient was around at the posterior interior front arteries and the presenter arteries. And also, we can see the superior internal parietal arteries. Also, uh, after the universal and moderator adjusted the analysis of the association, we found that the, the patient is uh, target, target collateral vessels. Uh, next, the most uh, the most to the uh, medial medullary arteries maybe have the more prevalence of the recurrent hemorrhage rate. Uh, so uh, we can see that uh, the most uh, uh, 
the uh, clatter, uh, clatters uh, presented with uh, hemorrhage was the, this type uh, called septendimal uh, clad feathers. We can see the anterior glider and uh, po posterior, uh, uh, posterior community arteries perforate, uh, like the uh, thalamic perforates and the posterior sclerotic artery laters. Uh, also, uh, another uh, uh, preventrical anastomosis was called inner intrastrator and inner thalamic arteries. We can see the medial straight arteries and the slum uh, perforates. But uh, there was another more uh, safety clatter from an under pathway. We can see the left meningo arteries and the trans uh, cortical arteries. Uh, I think while the patients got the uh, more pre prevalence for the stemia, uh, stem uh, and the inner intrastrial and the intraslamic hemorrhage, maybe they have the difference between the uh, safety clusters between the left meningo and the transcultural nasmosis. So, uh, I think uh, the uh, more patients, more more patients, the most uh, clatter uh, from the transcortical is from the uh, ophthalmic observer arteries and uh, metamental arteries and uh, occipital, art occipital arteries and uh, and other or like the uh, SDA uh, superior temporal arteries uh, and the left meningeal arteries maybe was like the uh, more province from the uh, posterior, posterior circulation like the uh, trans uh, cholesterol and uh, occipital bridal arteries so I think, uh, so we, uh, our team was got a more focus on the left major arteries and the dural, trans dural cortical arteries, uh, concept, uh, for this, this uh, disease. So, uh, we recruit 44 patients, uh, hemorrhage patients got a conservative treatment. Uh, excluded uh, one patient uh, at once over 65 years and one uncontrolled uh, hypertension and uh, diabetes mellitus and uh, five patients uh, who's got uh, uh, got the hemorrhage events before and uh, involved the evaluation for the uh, collateral and one patient got uh, incubical hemorrhage sites so uh, another 30, uh, 36 patients got the four a follow clinic follow up. Uh, after five years follow up, um, there were um, third, uh, fifteen patients got a recurrent hemorrhage, and the twenty one patients got without recurrent hemorrhage. Uh, I think we can see that yes, about uh, uh, nearly forty percent of patients got a recurrent hemorrhage events. Uh, after the uh, excluded the uh, equivocal recurrent hemorrhage sites and recurrent image results are no and the congenital hemorrhage. Uh, we can see uh, there was five patients got final five final analysis, and also in the recurrent hemorrhage cases, and also eight patient got final analysis. Uh, so uh, I think the patient is uh, so less, but maybe we can have the preliminary results for this uh, clatter and analysis. Uh, first, uh, we. We cut patients is uh, cortex a uh, cortex uh, into two time, uh, into two place. Uh, we got uh, we got the uh, first uh, rabbit root to the later uh, later later uh, external occipital or uh, protuberance line. Uh, we separated the patient into anterior type and uh, posterior type. Uh, the anterior type may be first on the uh, arterial territories located at the optic front arteries and uh, uh, frontal polar arteries and the anterior internal frontal arteries and the middle internal frontal arteries and the several portion of the uh, posterior internal frontal arteries characters and the posterior uh, type may be uh, considered uh, considered as a uh, 
the ter uh, territories located at the uh, percentual lobster arteries and the super internal parietal arteries and the inferior internal parietal arteries arteries also uh, located as that was located at the uh, PCA's uh, constipated uh, territories like the uh, parietal occipital arteries. So uh, this uh, rep represent cases about this patient. Uh, this is the 50-year-old man experienced the recurrent hemorrhage in the estilateral hemorrhage. The initial CT uh, image indicates the patient's hemorrhage site was located at the preventive portion of the left thalamus. Uh, after after the uh, over uh, nearly nearly four years conservative treatment, the patient got a further recurrent hemorrhage. Uh, we can see that the hemorrhage site was located at the uh, initial hemorrhage site. We can see that uh, this is left. Uh, this is the left uh, ha uh, ha uh, left hemisphere pharynx uh, cons uh, collateral constipations. We can see that uh, we can see the uh, middle cortex uh, uh, collateral constipations. We can see that uh, in the uh, temper anterior type, uh, we can see that the um, ipsilateral, maybe, maybe this ipsilateral uh, collateral from the ophthalmic arteries may be constipated to the uh, anterior, uh, anterior uh, to the uh, uh, frontal polar and the, the uh, anterior uh, internal uh, frontal artery territories. And we can see that uh, the mid meningeal menig menig artery is constipated to the ipsilateral, maybe the most portion of the middle cortex portion. We can see that. Then uh, we can see only a uh, several, uh, several uh, uh, clatters uh, derived, from the, derived from the posterior. Uh, many arteries can constipate it to, the, to the several posterior portion of the uh, medial cortex. Also, we can see there was uh, uh, left many arteries can uh, 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 caught, uh, transclateral difficulty located at the posterior portion. We can see that. So the patient got a further recurrent hemorrhage. Also, we can see that the patient is the target uh, anesthetic arteries was the land cruciate arteries. We can see that. Uh, this is another patient. Uh, this is a sixty-nine-year-old man uh, experienced a recurrent hemorrhage in the its lateral hemisphere. We can see that the CT image indicates indicates the initial hemorrhage in the subarachnoid head space. Yes, the CT image opened uh, 11 months later. The patient got a recurrent hemorrhage in the initial hemorrhage site. We can see that. Uh, also, we can see, uh, we can analyze the left uh, uh, collateral anesthesis. We can see that. Uh, we can see maybe uh, the uh, Manager, uh, left manager arteries from the right, uh, right, uh, right, ACAs can separate to the, yes, most, uh, uh, medial cortex of the left hemisphere. And, uh, we can see that, uh, we can see that also that the collateral transcortical from the left, uh, uh, occipital arteries Conservated to the same portions of the posterior uh, medial cortex of the left hemisphere. Uh, but uh, we can see the uh, the collateral conservation from the posterior constriction. We can see that uh, there was uh, the transcarcer and the collateral from collaterals from the uh, occipital and parietal arteries. There was there was the steer uh, flow decency located and we can see that maybe near the uh, peri paracentral territory arteries artery territories. So the patient got a further current hemorrhage.
uh, this is another patient. The patient is uh, uh, who got the long recurrent uh, events. This is a uh, 52 year old man patient explained a uh, intraventricular hemorrhage and it was treated, uh, treated with conservative treatment. And CT imaging indicates the initial hemorrhage site located the right front uh, right front home of the late French core. And after about uh, over 60 months of the clinical follow-up, follow -up, the patient uh, got the no further recurrent hemorrhage. Also, we can see uh, the right hemisphere's uh, medial cortex, the collateral pathway. We can see that uh, the patient is uh, posterior community arteries was uh, opened and the, he, who had the uh, type type community, uh, posterior community arteries. We can see that uh, the patient is, uh, also can got the can cause the constipation uh, from the ispilateral uh, occipital arteries. Also, the this uh, this cleft pathway is, is also uh, feeding to the maybe the flow F, uh, F uh, the flow F curve is to the ipsilateral. Uh, medial cortex the territories so the patient had uh, no obvious uh, medial cortex uh, uh, flow uh, deficit, deficit so i think the patient maybe uh, has no obvious uh, medial cortex medial cortex collateral deficit so the patient got there was no further intraventricular hemorrhage uh, so uh, this is baseline character of this patient we can see that uh, there was no obvious uh, difference between these two uh, groups. Uh, but after the network's uh, analysis from these uh, two patients, uh, these two groups, we can see that uh, the collateral type from the transdural and the left major collateral pathways, there was no, ob uh, there was no obvious different differences. But uh, after we, after we uh, analyze analysis, uh, According to the uh, left manager flow deficiency, the uh, deficiency is uh, feeding tetras. Feeding tetras. We can see that the patient is, uh, uh, got the recurrent hemorrhage site. A uh, recurrent hemorrhage maybe have the more pre pre prevalence of the posterior medial cortex uh, flow deficiency. Yes, uh, this is a. Maybe it's a preliminary uh, analysis for our course to focus on the uh, left manager and the transcultural uh, kind of press basis for, uh, for, the, uh, for the importance in the hemorrhage moral disease. Uh, I, uh, now, uh, with the development of the uh, imaging, uh, we can see that the MRA, maybe the black uh, sensitive uh, MRA, maybe have them more. Uh, more more suitable for analysis analysis for this just way. So I think the further the patient who got a uh, recurrent hemorrhage or or the or the initial hemorrhage will got a more further uh, imaging evaluation for the uh, uh, collateral pathways evaluation, especially for the uh, transdural and the left meningeal artery collateral pathway. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Jiang Wang. Very, very excellent and informative talk. talk. And uh, first of all, I just want to con uh, congratulate on your excellent work and your fantastic uh, patient results and uh, treated with uh, excellent cases. Thank you. And uh, so you have so many inform information regarding the uh, uh, hemorrhage risk of the patient with the moya moya disease especially yes. yeah we japanese has a you mentioned in your presentation professor takahashi uh, uh at all or mentioned about the frequency of the uh breathing rate in the posterior type is very high risk of yeah if the patient has a, a collateral uh <laughs> Choroidal anastomosis in the patient with a choroidal anastomosis, the patient may have a high risk of recurrent rate of the uh, intraparenchymal hemorrhage or interventricular hemorrhage. Yes. So 
Yeah, but、uh, you, you, your, your case is so similar to that patient. Is also the some、uh, medial cortical insufficiency is also suffering the,、uh, some kind of collateral、uh, anastomosis is a high risk of bleeding rate. So, so I, I just think about the.、Uh, <clears throat> so, did you confirm the patient、uh, you sa, sa with a collateral colloidal anastomosis post operatively? The collateral risk decreased flow. Did you confirm on the angiogram or not? Thank you. Oh, sorry. Can you、oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, me, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Oh, the, if, if, the, if, the, if the patient has a collateral flow in the colloidal anastomosis and a left meningeal, some kind of left meningeal anastomosis or a, a colloidal type anastomosis, so you did it,、uh, a bypass surgery for the patient to devascularization. After the bypass surgery, and、uh, one year or two y e a r you can, you should, you, I think you may perform the Uh, angiogram, f o l l o w up angiogram here. And you can, did you confirm the collateral flow decreased in the flow in, on the angiogram? Because、yes. uh, flow works well, and、uh, maybe the collateral blood flow may be decreased post operatively in a long term follow up. So, did you find some other, other some kind of finding on the angiogram post operatively? Thank you. Thank you, Professor.、Uh, this is a very excellent question. Yes,、uh, because、uh, the presentation was most of the angiographic images、uh, for the initial,、uh, initial state,、uh, because there was no,、uh, all the patients got the further、uh, angiographic、uh, flow, flow up because of the further granny hemorrhage.、Uh, but some about thir-、uh, 30%, 30%, 30% of the patients got a further. Recurrent hemorrhage got a、uh, uh, further DSA、uh, follow up. We found that、um, most the uh, uh, most uh, preventable uh, uh, anesthesis was similar to the initial state,、mm. uh, especially uh, for the especially for us for the、uh, cried artery anesthesis and the lent c r y s t a l artery anesthesis. Uh, but the, the patient got,、uh, got a trans, uh, trans, uh, trans, uh, translamic and uh, uh, land crew anesthesis.、Uh, similar patient because,、uh, because of the、uh, PCAs involved in, in、uh, sternal, sternotic l e s s i o n s progression.、Mm-hmm. Some、uh, slamic arteries pathways may be increased. But We can see that the patient who got a、uh, uh, ECIC bypass,、uh, most、uh, flow may be increased during the first, first years and the, in, the, in these hemorrhage patients. But about the tw-、uh, over, thir- uh, over three years、uh, later, the patient's、uh, blood flow was,、uh, was stable.、Uh, we can see that. Uh, most easy ice bypass sur-、uh, surgeries can, uh, the uh, flow can cover the later portion、mm-hmm. of the hemisphere. And some,、uh, some medial cortex、uh, territories could g o t the uh, enough uh, flow covered. So、uh, when the、uh, target anesthesis、uh, outflow to these、uh, medial cortex、uh, territories, the patient was g o t、uh, more further. Recurrent hemorrhage.、Mm. I see. So I just think about your comment regarding giving your comment. So, so did you recommend the patient to, we should perform to,、uh, the ACA revascularization for the ACA territory? So that I mean,、uh, especially so SDA, ACA bypass, or、uh, <laughs> maybe it's a much more difficult surgical procedure, but.、Uh, More ideal, more, more regional pro,、uh, surgical strategy is the revascularization for the ACA territory. So, direct by anastomosis to the SDA, ACA anastomosis. How do you comment? Thank you. 
I think, I think, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, the ACA char uh, characters uh, revascularization is, is more uh, uh, considered for the uh, Moira disease surgical interventional uh, surgeons. We can see that uh, maybe the ACA uh, and uh, we can use uh, uh, some other uh, pathways to cover this flow. But uh, we can see that uh, because most of the media cost in the uh, flow uh, Deficacy was located at the posterior portion. Mm -hmm. uh, the routine ACA's uh, revascularization uh, method is not suitable for prevent the recurrent hemorrhoids. I think mm -hmm. uh, the further maybe if we uh, you can find the uh, uh, target uh, clot vessels to to the tetras, I think uh, the patient has got a uh, uh, further revascularizations or, or initial revascularizations may be focused on the uh, post, uh, posterior portion of the medial mm -hmm. cortex. I think the uh, OA I see. is more simple for this bypass. So it's not a simple matter to resolve the problem. So you, that means that just perform there are several kinds of yes, yes. we have to give the patients. Yes. I see. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So so my my last question is uh, how do you manage the post operative patient uh, is such kind of uh, uh, several complex collateral visceral oh, your voice how is, do you, sorry. Yeah, sorry how sorry. how do you treat the patient with a post operative in such a such a kind of a complex to, uh, collateral visceral flow to be, 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 because uh, how, how do you manage the blood pro, blood pressure or uh, uh, how do you manage the anti antiparietal drug or uh, something like that to, to avoid the recurrence of the uh, stroke? Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> this is another very excellent and uh, difficult for me. Uh, uh, you know, Professor Shibi maybe is the famous uh, ECIT bypass surgery in, uh, favor, uh, in the worldwide. We, we see that maybe about over the 20,000 patients got the ECI by bypass mm -hmm. from him. Yes, I questioned for him this uh, question. He said, uh, uh, during the, these 10 years, uh, 10 years, uh, the, the professor being only got the one of a bypass for prevent uh, the Moema disease uh, recurrent hemorrhage or uh, recurrent uh, events. But uh, due to the, there was no uh, Enough patient got a follow, uh, another uh, evacuate, uh, uh, got a fall, uh, got an accurate follow up. Mm. We couldn't, we couldn't uh, uh, know that you know, how many patients got a uh, recurrent hemorrhages, uh, got the uh, professor shoes bypasses and stretches to, to these patients. Uh, but uh, um, our pa our city is nearly the Shanghai in China. Uh, several patients. Uh, got uh, to our hospitals, got a follow-up. Uh, during these three years, about five patients got a recurrent hemorrhage after the ECI bypass mm -hmm. bilateral. And one patient was, uh, one, one patient targeted, uh, uh, targeted, uh, targeted, uh, uh, collateral vessels were derived from the lenticular arteries. And it's another three patient was lenticular, lenticular, uh, located at the uh, posterior Cried arteries. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the patient got the bilateral ACI bypass. I think it is difficult for the, these patients got the further uh, surgical intervention. So maybe the OA bypass is considered for these patients. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But Thank the you. but the lateral three three arteries. Uh, uh, maybe the three patients is targeted <coughs> uh, targeted uh, 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 derived from the. Uh, Later, uh, posterior cardiac arteries is suitable for these such uh, stresses. But the, another two patients uh, derived uh, target the collateral derived from the lateral artery. I see the the feeding tetris is located at the uh, uh, posterior internal arteries and the uh, uh, paracentral arteries. Uh, feeding tetris. I think is uh, maybe I I I don't know uh, if it's the only bypass is can 
got the flow uh, outflow to these terriers. Maybe the uh, uh, multiple barrel uh, surgeries may be uh, suitable for these terriers. Is uh, is fifty. Mm, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Excellent comment. So, I just want to ask another comment from the audience or back to the Raja. Do you, do you any comments from, from Joe? You would like to ask anything, Joe? Mm -hmm. Unmute oh, yourself. Uh, was an excellent lecture. Um, very new concepts. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. I think it was indeed a wonderful uh, session, enlightening session. We did not do it. The things were so complicated in my mind. So, thank you very much. Uh, I will close this officially now on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Yoko Kato. I would like to thank both the speakers and chairs of today, Prof. Amar Abouhab Hamdan, Prof. Jiang Wang and Prof. Vladimir Venes and Prof. Hidhiru Tokumara for the kind support for the ACNS webinars. A very special thanks to Prof. Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. And as I mentioned earlier, there are around 800 people who have joined us live today. A special thanks also to my co-host Dr. Liu Bun Seng and my friend Joe E. Sam for joining me today. So until we all meet online tomorrow, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.